Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 22nd lecture of uh, surface engineering. Uh, well, having uh, first uh, defined what is surface engineering and uh, but even before that uh, we started talking about uh, various classification of engineering solids, uh, the evolution of microstructure, the various uh, defects associated with solids and uh, we uh, classified various kinds of surface engineering techniques. Uh, uh, but before that we also classified different surface dependent properties of the physical, chemical and uh, structural properties or mechanical properties. And then we discuss at length about each of these properties separately. Uh, but now is the time when we actually uh, should discuss uh, specific surface engineering techniques. Uh, to begin with, uh, we may broadly classify the entire uh, gamut of surface engineering into two major groups, uh, the conventional surface engineering which are very age old practices, uh, very well established and many of them are still very widely practiced because they are economical and they are easy to implement and they have a large utility in various manufacturing practices. Uh, we also will uh, discuss some of the advanced surface engineering techniques uh, which could be uh, essentially um, uh, thin film based or uh, using direct energy beams and so on. So to begin with uh, the conventional practices, the very first uh, technique we are going to discuss today is called shot pinning or pinning for that matter. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, if you just uh, uh, you know, think of a hammer, so if this is the hammer, one portion of the hammer will have a flat head and the other portion will have, have a round head. So this rounded portion is called the pin. So the blunted or the rounded head of the hammer is called the pin. And when you hit any flat surface with this kind of a rounded head, so obviously it's going to create certain deformation and that will be a diffuse deformation. When you deform, then you create a deformation zone underneath and that particular zone, uh, if it's a metallic material, is likely to create certain higher density of dislocations and uh, also because of the recovery process uh, there will be a residual stress developed which is compressive in nature. So this is the principal theme of short pinning that you apply limited surface deformation and the material deforms only up to a very limited depth but during the process of recovery certain amount of state of stress is created which is residual in nature that means when you have re removed the load still that particular stress remains and that stress uh, incidentally uh, is of compressive nature which is beneficial for very many uh, me uh, mechanical uh, applications or applications which are actually subjected to various mechanical deformation. So uh, when we actually try to deform uh, there, could be, there, there is always, if you look at the typical stress strain diagram, there will be initially an elastic region proportional and then followed by a plastic deformation region. So we are essentially talking about this region which is beyond the yield stress. But this deformation zone as I said is very limited from the surface. So if this is the bulk we are talking about just, I mean way less than millimeter maybe of only a few micrometer depth of deformed layer. So this deformed layer is limited to what is known as subsurface region. The bulk may actually uh, develop residual tensile stress but the surface will develop residual compressive stress. So what are the benefits? Why do we intend to do that? These kind of residual uh, state of stress which is compressive in nature actually is um, useful so that because it provides resistance to crack opening or propagation it improves the fatigue life or reduces fatigue failure, it creates resi resistance to corrosion fatigue, stress corrosion or cavitation erosion. So all these surface damages are reduced 
minimized or, or in some cases even prevented if we can create such a uh, state of stress which is uh, compressive in nature. In certain uh, manufacturing operations for example, welding and that to welding of caster and there is no post weld treatment possible and we all know that in any fusion uh, uh, welding process or fusion joining process when the liquid solidifies the state of stress on the surface is tensile in nature which is uh, not very conducive for uh, creating uh, or inducing greater fatigue strength. In other words, if there is a crack onto the surface under residual tensile stress, the crack can easily open. So, if you have a crack here and if you have a residual tensile stress, then obviously this crack can very easily open and we do not want this to happen. So, we would always prefer to have a situation where the state of stress is working towards each other or compressive in nature. So, for a welded zone particularly at the uh, root of the welded zone, if we can create such residual compressive stress by way of hitting with the uh, ultrafine spherical balls, then that is beneficial. It can be done on a flat surface, it can be done even on curved or uh, surfaces with complex geometry. So, there are three possible ways of uh, introducing such residual compressive stress onto the surface. Typically, the shot pinning where we use spherical shots, needle pinning where actually you, we new, use a cluster of needles, very fine ultrafine needles uh, made from hardened steel or we can do hammer pinning. So, this can be a single metal rod uh, hitting onto the surface and uh, so this is wider. So, this is the finest and this is this also could be fairly fine but this is the widest or the wider uh, level of deformation uh, done onto the surface. Now, um, for shot pinning uh, using this uh, uh, impacting uh, spherical shots, uh, we actually can enhance the fatigue strength as I mentioned on typical injuring components like gear parts, the camshaft, clutch spring, coil spring, connecting rods, crankshafts all kinds of rotating members, ro rock drills and so on, uh, where uh, uh, fatigue is a standard way of failure. And if we can create a residual compressive stress onto the surface, then we defer, we actually uh, in some cases even prevent such crack growth or fatigue failure. So, it is a cold working process obviously, because we most of these are done at room temperature or certainly way below the crystallization temperature. So, the deformation zone or the deformation effects are retained onto the sample. It imparts a small indentation just like uh, when we use uh, hard for hardness testing, when we press a hardened steel ball onto the surface, we create an indentation in the same way, but the spherical uh, objects that we are throwing are ultra fine, very small. So, the indentation size is very, very small and this indentation is done by so called spherical objects called shots and the effect is called pinning just be like it is very similar to the pinning with a hammer. So, the forces that actually we apply for individual impact is uh, actually compressive in nature. So, there is a very small deformation zone and uh, so initially let us say this is the object which is uh, 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 propelled onto the surface at some very high velocity. So, when it impacts to the surface we create certain deformation zone like here. And as we create deformation zone, we try to push the material downwards and the reaction to that will be such that the material will try to come back. And when it tries to come back, the state of stress that we create onto the surface is uh, compressive in nature. So, we create residual compressive stress onto the surface. Now, this is for a single impact. If we have multiple impacts of very small size balls, we are talking about 0.5 millimeter. So, fairly small 500 micrometer and when we have multiple such uh, impact events occurring onto the surface. So, they are all uh, uh, in essentially uh, incident onto the surface and uh, when, the when the first uh, impact occurs, the second one actually need not come simultaneously at the same spot. But the second one comes after a time lag and when it falls in another portion, there will be some overlap, overlap of plastic region. So, if this is the plastic zone 
created by the first impact. The second impact, which will have certain overlapping region, will have this amount of overlapping zone. So, in the process, the deformation that we create onto the surface will have more or less uniform depth, but also will have fairly uh, homogeneous deformation structure onto the surface. So, we end up getting a region onto the surface which will carry a uh, compressive state of stress. Now, what are the uh, various uh, media that we can use for such impact making? We can use uh, spheres made of hardened steel, we can use cut wires of steels of uh, high aspect ratio, we can use glass beads which are, which are very high elastic modulus. Uh, we can even use ceramic beads which can have even higher modulus. So, these are non-deformable substances, very high hardness and most importantly rigid and they do not deform. In fact, they do deform and if they deform substantially, then we need to change the set of shots that we are using for shot bidding. The diameter uh, usually is very similar or the same throughout the media. Now, uh, we control the intensity by uh, applying certain uh, empirical relationships, which is uh, created through uh, by using so called the Almond strip. Uh, so, essentially, you actually have a steel strip onto the surface, and then by way of hitting this, uh, hitting by these uh, shots, uh, the strip actually um, bends towards the uh, impacting side, and by looking at the uh, angle of bending, we actually can make an uh, uh, educated guess about the amount of compressive stress that we are creating and accordingly we can actually manipulate the velocity uh, and hence the momentum with which these shots are impacting the surface. Uh, so, when we actually allow such shots to uh, hit the surface at uh, very high speed, um, we actually uh, uh, can make use of this kind of a calibration using the Alman strip uh, to, to uh, control the speed and control the level of stress uh, that we can generate onto the surface. Um, so, there are many very many advantages of using such, uh, such uh, an action. So, uh, the first and foremost thing or the principal thing is that we are able to create such uh, residual compressive stress onto the surface and this goes on to prevent uh, various types of corrosion, galling, fretting or cracking type of a wire wear uh, or abrasion. It can minimize or prevent hydrogen embrittlement. It also creates certain very small dents instead of pores, I would rather call them dents. And these dents actually could, it, so on the surface you create such little bit of waviness, uh, the depth of which could be uh, much less than uh, tens of a micrometer, maybe a few micrometers. But these dents actually are good so, because they can uh, reserve some amount of uh, or contain some amount of lubricants, which actually are useful for subsequent uh, motion between the surfaces. Um, usually, by way of this deformation, we actually um, uh, create certain deformation texture, and but the finished surface can easily be subjected to final finish or painting. Now, the benefit wise, the biggest benefit for example, here we are describing the number of cycles uh, uh, and uh, so essentially the state of stress or the maximum stress required for failure uh, for a, a given number of cycles. So, the maximum number of cycles required for failure. So, this we know uh, typically is uh, the so called uh, endurance limit and when we have the same material subjected to severe grinding operations, gentle grinding operations and severe grinding followed by short pinning operation, what we see is that at any given uh, number of uh, cycles, the endurance limit is always highest. So, the uh, maximum endurance is created when we follow uh, grinding with short pinning. So, this kind of short pinning operation for example, is very useful on all rotating parts I already mentioned and such kind of a big crank shaft uh, we can introduce. Now, th because of this large size, you cannot do any operations easily on this kind of a component, but you can bring in a gun and you can do short pinning on this kind of a surface, curved surface and create residual compressive stress and that is how you can improve the fatigue strength. 
I have already explained that uh, when the impact happens, you actually create a small indentation or so called dimple and there is a little curvature created and this curvature due to multiple subsequent shots from uh, several other randomly falling objects will essentially create a uniform depth of deformation and uniform area coverage throughout the surface. The biggest advantage always we should remember is the creation of this uh, state of compressive stress onto the surface where the forces are actually acting towards each other and hence if at all there is any crack or discontinuity created first this crack has to see a situation where the state of stress is reversed from compressive to tensile and then only this crack can further open. So, this is kind of a preventive measure created by the state of stress uh, uh, which actually prevents any kind of crack growth particularly under fatigue or uh, such operations. So, you can do a mechanical short pinning, you can do dual pinning where you can actually have um, uh, pinning uh, initially with a particular size followed by another size maybe a smaller shot with lower intensity. So, actually the if this is the depth of the deformed zone then actually the state of stress that you create can vary. So, it actually everything is uh, negative, but the, uh, the amplitude will be uh, lower or higher along the depth. So, as a result you can have a graded state of stress toward the surface. Instead of uh, mechanical uh, impact, you can use a laser uh, assisted shock wave which can create such state of, state of compressive stress on the surface. You can also do strain peening uh, by using um, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, impacting objects. So, this is sort of uh, uh, an idea as to how small these shots are compared to the overall surface that we are trying to treat. So, uh, in this cartoon you cannot make out the size difference, but imagine this is less than a millimeter, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeter. And this surface area can easily be uh, a meter by meter or half a meter by half a meter. So, obviously you require uh, a gun which actually will be uh, throwing these projectiles and the projection will be little uh, divergent, but depending on this distance and the velocity with which they are coming, the size and the weight and the material of these shots, the state of uh, the condition onto the surface, uh, the angle of incidence, all these uh, parameters will determine what will be the state of stress. Now, um, so, so this is if this is the neutral plane and this is the tensile side and this is the uh, compression side. So, by way of introducing such short pinning, you actually uh, always uh, create a residual stress which is compressive in nature. And this actually can be fairly large, uh, for example, the total at certain depth below the surface, you actually can have fairly large uh, amplitude, large magnitude of residual stress created. So, there are actually various factors which uh, influence the uh, residual stress uh, development onto the surface. The most important thing that we have to realize that if you are talking about a large surface area and each of the shot is only this small, then you actually need quite a bit of uh, uh, the entire operation should have a fair amount of overlapping. Otherwise, you cannot create a uniform state of stress throughout. And this uh, kind of uh, uh, possibility is uh, can be actually modeled through uh, typically an Avrami equation, uh, which is a function of the size and the uh, velocity and uh, also the um, uh, speed at which they are covering the entire surface integration for the entire surface. So, Parameters that we need to uh, actually take into account are the uh, mass and the rate at which the mass uh, is impacting the surface, the density, the radius of these shots, obviously the area that uh, uh, is spread under the deformed zone and certainly the time uh, for uh, cumulative time for this uh, entire process. Okay.
So imagine, uh, so this is the fatigue strength of a particular material against the UTS of that particular material. Now, when you, when you compare different kinds of conditions, so this is the condition of the, of the particular steel without, uh, uh, without short pinning. This is with, uh, this is also without short pinning, uh, but this is with uh, definite amount of short pinning. So that means after the short pinning operation, what we see is that the fatigue strength of the material is uniformly increasing as the as the UTS of the material is going up, or in or in other words, at higher and higher level of UTS or higher level of hardness level, we actually see after short pinning that the fatigue strength of the material uniformly increases. So that certainly is very very beneficial for all kinds of rotating. Uh, components. In fact, uh, uh, for a given steel which is carburized steel, now normally uh, we will, we have not discussed as yet, but uh, carburizing treatment followed by a certain surface um, thermal treatment develops uh, predominantly martensitic microstructure. And when we develop martensitic microstructure, then we uh, believe, we actually may expect that the state of stress onto the surface is residual uh, compressive in nature. But what it is shown here is that for a carburized steel, this is the neutral plane. So, obviously, this is in the compression zone. So, the residual stress is compressive in nature, but when you actually follow uh, the carburizing and heat treatment with follow it up with a short pinning, then the state of stress can be actually much low, much higher in magnitude in the negative direction, meaning the magnitude of residual stress is much higher if you uh, follow up carburizing with uh, short pinning. So, at higher and higher level of uh, pinning velocity, you, you develop actually much uh, higher uh, residual stress. But what is more even more important is that the state of stress actually is confined to very shallow depth from, to, from the surface. So, you leave most of the bulk unaffected, only the near surface region is affected, which can be just about 100 uh, micrometer or less. There are typical advantages. For example, this process I told you at the very beginning that we consider short pinning to be one of the conventional practices, but it has it has it is uh, being used for uh, you know more than hundred years. But that's simply because the process is very simple and inexpensive and can be easily applied. You don't need a, a very high level of skill set for applying this short pinning. Uh, and it can be the most important thing is it can be used on all kinds of metals, not just steel. For example, non-ferrous metals or cast iron or um, uh, various kinds of metallic coatings and uh, welded joints and so on and so forth. But usually confined to metals because you do require a certain deformation, plastic deformation, uh, generation of dislocations, higher dislocation density, which is what will be responsible for creation of residual compressive stress. For example, if you are on the other hand, if you are talking about uh, silicate glass or uh, uh, nitrides or carbides or borides or boride coated uh, components, it is very difficult to imagine that uh, short pinning will create residual compressive stress onto the surface because there is no uh, surface deformation possible by way of uh, impacting with this uh, steel shots. But there are certain disadvantages all, all these. For example, if you are talking about a large surface area, then to cover the entire surface area and make exactly uniform state of stress requires quite a bit of uh, uh, trial and uh, uh, various kinds of experimentation. And uh, there will be always certain level of um, variations at submicron level. Uh, also, we believe that the shots, we expect the shots should always remain geometrically spherical and maintain the same level of hardness. But uh, these ones are supposed to be very rigid, but if you are dealing with steel shots or even you can use uh, carbide uh, shots or some other ceramic materials, but they do get deformed after a while. So, instead of complete spherical, if this becomes oblate or uh, such kind of a non-spherical shape, then obviously the shot can hit either in a flat condition like this or in a perpendicular condition like this. So, as a result, your entire Hertzian distribution of impact 
is going to be affected. So whatever you have calibrated, you may not derive the same effect. So in that case, uh, we need to make sure that the shots should actually remain spherical. And uh, just to uh, ensure that what you should do is, uh, depending on the material that you are treating, uh, beyond a certain period, you should change the, um, the shots uh, time to time or uh, introduce fresh uh, lot of shots. Uh, so, we need certain changes at regular intervals. And also, if you have really very complex shape and geometry, now normally because the shot size is very small, as I said, uh, much less than a millimeter, maybe less than even half a millimeter. So, even at the root of a weld, you can uh, expect uh, shots to cover. But if you have really very complex shape and also uh, crevices like this, then it is very difficult to go all the way down. So, for example, if you are uh, dealing with a, uh, uh, with a ball bearing and the bearing is very complex where the root is very, very narrow and way uh, deep below, then there will be difficulty in reaching up to the bottom of the root, bottom of the, uh, uh, the teeth. So, um, again, uh, here is a nice comparison that this is uh, so. This is basically the rotating uh, st bending stress that you, the member experiences, and this is the number of cycles. So when you have a carburized uh, condition of steel, this is how the uh, the fatigue uh, behavior is expressed. When you actually follow up carburizing with uh, conventional short pinning, then the situation is improved. So you have slightly higher. Um, endurance limit, but when you have carbonitriding followed by hard short pinning, then the fatigue life is significantly improved. So, it is not just the surface treatment alone, I mean the chemical treatment alone which uh, fetches the result, but combination of the uh, surface chemistry change followed by this mechanical control deformation can actually give you much higher fatigue strength. And uh, this uh, actually is uh, important for all kinds of uh, uh, metallic materials, particularly various types of steel. So, here is a carburized steel with on, on this particular alloy and this is a spark gears. And uh, um, so, typically uh, the number of cycles required for uh, failure would be much more when you have high intensity short pinning on the same material. So, time to recapitulate. Uh, um, First of all, we have understood what is a pin, which is the, uh, the rounded or the blunted head uh, side of a hammer. And pinning means as if you are hitting with such blunted heads. So, when you hit, you deform up to a limited depth and this kind of a deformation can create a, a certain uh, level of uh, accumulation of dislocation, creation and accumulation of dislocations, which in turn can create a residual compressive stress. So, um, and that's, that brings in certain uh, uh, beneficial effects as far as fatigue strength or several other mechanical uh, properties are concerned. The mechanism is uh, more or less uh, same, um, no matter what kind of uh, pinning process we are doing, whether with uh, shots or pin uh, needles or with some other agencies, wires and so on. Uh, but the so principal mechanism remains the same. Um, the state of residual compressive stress is created because of the mechanism that I just explained that you deform, you indent the material flows and the reaction to that is uh, to bring the material pull in to the center. So, you create a state of stress which will actually act towards each other. So, this kind of a state of stress which acts towards each other is the compressive stress and onto the surface when we create that by way of this short pinning, uh, we create uh, higher or improve the fatigue strength. Uh, usually metallic materials and alloys which actually are amenable to deformation, plastic deformation easily, they are the ones which are suitable for short pinning and not the ultra hard or non-deformable rigid solids. For example, you do not do it for a semiconductor or a, a carbide or nitride at surface and so on. The, uh, the process of uh, short pinning is uh, throwing of those hard objects onto the surface, plastic deformation, tendency to recover and then creation of the state of stress which is compressive in nature. 
And uh, this is what we need to understand that how it varies from material to material. So obviously you won't throw at the same velocity with the same mass or the same size of the shots to all kinds of metals. I mean uh, it cannot be a universal velocity, size and uh, uh, type of materials uh, that are used as shots for different kinds of materials to be shot pinned. Um, so, uh, what actually uh, we learn a final takeaway from this uh, discussion so far is that uh, even though it is a conventional process, but short pinning is still a very widely practiced economical and very, very effective means of creating residual compressive stress on flat or curved surfaces even with complex geometry. So, that we are able to create residual compressive stress and for all rotating members or members which actually experience cyclic uh, stresses, uh, this creates um, a higher fatigue life for the material. Thank you very much.